Coming up on Hobbies, Crafts, and Collectibles today, we have a great show. As you can see, we have some interesting things to talk about, but first we're going to talk to Dan Rebel of Charleston about his acrylic painting, and then we'll talk to Kit Maurice of Charleston about her wonderful folk art collection, which you're seeing some of right here. That's all coming up next on Hobbies, Crafts, and Collectibles, so stay tuned. I'm here with Dan Rebel now from Charleston. Dan, thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And Dan is, as you can kind of see around us here, an acrylic painter. So how long have you been doing that, Dan? I've only been painting for about two years. Um, just magically picked it up one day when uh, a friend invited us to come over on a Sunday. For, and actually, I, went, I was taking my wife over so she could paint because she'd done some paintings. Okay. And they put a canvas in front of me and I just started painting and I, and I just found something that in me that I didn't know was there. So it was just kind of a natural thing, huh? It yeah. wasn't like a, someone taught you and then you went and meticulously no, did it. No, no, they just put some brushes and paints in front of me and said, put on there whatever you think. And <laughs> I painted this kind of weird little uh, almost planet thing with some cones on it. And, okay. And that was the start of it. And is that kind of the theme of your work? Is it all things that come from your mind? Yes, yes. I don't go off of photographs or anything like that. I mean, I've, I've painted a couple pieces. I love Monet. I've painted a couple pieces in his style okay. and done similar pieces just to try to do that style of work. Okay. But what I do, I, it's just it's in my head. I look at the canvas and I say, okay, let's, I want this and I want this color, let's go. Okay, so it's just kind of whatever comes out. Whatever comes out. I kind of like that, Dan. I like that it's just, you do what you feel like doing. That's so. right, and every day will be different. I might get through a piece and then all of a sudden think, oh, I should have done this, and I'll start <laughs> another piece. Okay, so you don't go back over that one, huh? You leave no, it as no, is. no. Okay, and what's your favorite part about painting as you've kind of gotten into this over the last couple of years? Well, it's, there's really two parts that I, that I love. The, the creation and seeing what comes about off on the canvas mm -hmm. is, is so great. I. I paint for the feeling that the painting gives. Okay. I don't really, I don't do detail work. I don't care about the little tiny details or that it's this building or that building. I want a feeling to come from it. And when I look at it and I feel like, wow, that's really saying something and that, I feel good about that, that's wonderful. And then the other side of it mm -hmm. is if I have a piece displayed and they walk in and they look at it and they stare at it and they go, wow, that makes me feel good because I've he heard that many times. Sure. That is the accomplishment that's, that's best of all. Okay, so a little bit more about evoking feeling and kind of getting people interested in what you've got exactly, there. Exactly, exactly. Whatever attracts your attention, right? Exactly. Okay, well, um, what kind of techniques do you use? Are you pretty much standard or are there certain things that you like to do? Um, well, my technique is pretty much on, I guess you'd say, uh, an abstract style. Okay. I start with just basic colors. I do my background first, and then I work forward. Okay. Um, is that pretty typical of an artist, or is that just the way you do it? I think that's pretty typical. Um, a lot, most artists will, will work in a certain order, front to back or back to front, mm -hmm. um, but I like working from the back to front. That way, when I'm putting something over the top, even if there's something there I didn't want to be there, sure. I cover it up. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't have to worry about, well, I put this branch here and I have to cut in color here. Okay. It, it's not a problem. Right. So you just start in the back and then you move up to the smaller things. Right. In the front. Okay. Like when I'm doing my sunsets, I do a lot of sunsets. I'll start with the sun mm -hmm. and I'll start with the colors and I'll start blending off of that and do the other colors, the darker colors toward the outsides. Okay. And, and then I'll put in my foreground, my mountains or whatever. Sure, and is that kind of like what I, we've got going on behind me over right, here? Like, right, like that one step there. Step over so they can see this piece here. But yeah, you've got the, the colors I started here. with the yellow in the back. Okay. And then I blended the top. And then I decided I wanted the mountains in the front. And I just started going from the back to the front. Okay. And so, you know, and you were telling me before we came on here about how it's about what people see in it, right? It's not necessarily Correct. about, you know, what you're putting there. So that, that's how correct. does that work for you? I've had, and a lot of my big pieces, especially my abstract pieces, I'll do a piece and I'll see something there. And I think, hey, that came out really neat. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, this piece is one that's kind of like that. Okay. Um, it, some people see a pool there. Okay. But when I first did it, 
in this area here, I kind of saw a beak and the eye of a bird. Okay. Okay. So what I see is not necessarily what someone else sees, and it's so neat to find out what someone else sees in the painting. Okay. I'll have one painting, painting, and they'll see three or four different things, and especially in the abstract work. Okay. And you said you like to paint bigger things. Is oh, that I love to paint you big. Like big canvas. You give me a 36 by 48 <laughs> canvas, and and I'm happy. Um, I feel really constrained doing smaller pieces. Okay. Um, I've done a lot of 11 by 14s and such smaller pieces, mm -hmm. but a lot of those were done just when I was working on my blending techniques, because I do a lot of blending, and started learning blending colors and how it came out and how much to use and the, the hatching to get sure. the blend of the colors. Mm -hmm. So I've got, I've probably got 20 11 by 14s of just color blends. Okay. And I've thought about putting those up on a, like a three by three display oh, yeah, just of just colors and that. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, um, so most of my pieces are big though. I love okay. working big. Yeah, so do you display a lot of this art at your house? I mean, is it, do you paint your own art at your house? Um, I think we've got one piece up right <laughs> just now. One? Just one? Just one. <laughs> my, my wife would be happy with more. I know she okay. would. Um, but it seems like when I put one up and then I want to take it somewhere else, I get, I display a lot of stuff uh, uh, at the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever we don't have artists for the shop, I'll put all my stuff up. You know, okay. so it's handy having sure, the sure. art around. Um, so you displayed at your business. That yeah, works too. yeah. <laughs> why not? I mean, it, it makes it easy. But uh, at home, we've changed the one piece a couple times, but that really, that's about it. Just the one piece. Yeah. That's fu it's funny, you know, how a lot of people say that. You know, oh yeah, I do all this great stuff. Well, do you put it out at your house? Oh, maybe one or two. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and that's all right, you know. I mean, but it's a lot. You do a lot of different kinds of work, so you could have, yes. I guess, potentially a lot of different displays at your house sometime. You could. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you were doing this. Technique-wise, you're obviously self-taught. Have you been training any, with anybody or just kind of no, learning as um, you go? Kurt Starkey, the house that I talked about, we went on mm -hmm. Sundays, uh, and we still do that. And every Sunday, a group of us will get together, and some will do jewelry, some will do painting. Some, um, he's helped me in some, some areas. You know, when, when I'd get done with the piece, he would kind of point out, well, if you did this or this shadow or whatever, which has helped, but there hasn't been any, any in-depth training or anything like that, just more even like Dave Hunter, another friend of mine who's a great artist, will say, "Hey, well, what if you did this?" He always wants me to put eyeballs in the paintings, <laughs> you know. But yeah. but I, I never, I, I don't Dave, go I there. Yes, that. yes, yes. <laughs> but but so nothing formal. But yeah, I've had some people around me to kind of give some ideas. So My kind wife of a is always there. Group effort. Oh, and your wife? She, I'm sure she enjoys seeing. Oh, she does, product. and and she'll tell me if she thinks something is wonderful. Or if it, yeah, it's okay, or, and her taste is different than mine to a certain extent. Well, and isn't but, that the thing about art? You know, everybody's yeah. taste is kind of different. It seems like, like you said, people see different things in different paintings, so maybe the taste yeah. is different too. So. Definitely, definitely. And let's talk a little bit about some of these other pieces okay. that you have here. Like, let's talk about this one here in the middle of the table. This was a real departure for me um, because it's not my classic abstract piece right. or my bright colors, but it, I've always, I've seen some of the art that had been done by the masters, and I loved the turquoises and the, and the, the light colors, okay. but still having a lot of energy to them. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd give it a try, and I put a little couple characters in there, and I kind of blended them out. Because sure. I'm a Monet fan, okay. which mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't necessarily Monet, well, Monet style, yeah. but as he lost his vision, it, a lot of the pieces became less clear. So there's a little inspiration of that. Right, thing. right. So I did that, and I actually, I, I really enjoy doing pieces like that. I'll, I'm going to do more. This is a relatively recent piece. So. It's a little bit more detailed than you do normally. Too, yes, right? actually, like all, all the all the flowers across the front took as long to do as as the rest of the painting, right. pretty much. <laughs> okay, yeah. so this was a departure, but you know, that's part of art, I think, sometimes, oh, yes, is trying yes. new things, so. Oh, yes. Um, and then we have this one here, if you wanna hand that one to me. Oh, yeah. This is, this is one of my favorite. This is a recent piece. This brings in quite a few different things that I do. Um, I have this, of course, the sunsets and the colors, the bright right. colors I love, mm -hmm. and I've worked a lot on reflections in the water, which is all there. But a theme that I've really picked up a lot is the trees. I okay. do a lot of foreground trees and you notice that the branches are even connecting to each other mm -hmm. to where the energy of the tree is is connected and it's just like nature. Everything is connected to each, to each other. You know? so, so that's what it represents for you. Yes, it does. The well, sharing of, of life and energy. A lot more than just simple trees then. That's the great thing about art. A lot more than art. simple trees, right. <laughs> that is the great thing about art. And some it? people see that and some people it's explained to and then they see it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I 
I just love the color and the depth that the range of colors that this one brought to mm -hmm. us. And it has that, like you said, the sunsets that you love yeah. so much in there. Yeah. So it includes all your favorite things. But, yes. And are these the tools that you use when you are yes. painting? Yes. Yes. This is this is. I love is, that big brush. I think I could actually paint with something like that. I'm not a you can, talented You can get painter. a lot of paint. You can get a lot of paint <laughs> on this. This is even called the big bad brush. Um, but for those big pieces, I can really soak in a lot of paint and I can keep it wet and I can work fast. Okay. Because for blending on those big pieces, you got to keep that paint wet. So okay. you're working from tone to tone. And you said you like to work fast anyway, right? I love to work fast, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you said that, you know, we're talking about that tree painting. Right. That didn't take months. No, that was that was three hours okay. on, on a Sunday af a Sunday afternoon at, over at, at Kurtz, you know, um, and then I did another one after that. So, but I'll do a lot of my big backgrounds with something Bad. like this. Okay, uh, and then I, I love angled brushes. Okay. They're they're cut at an angle mm -hmm. um, because I can I can go I can go in a painting and I can I can actually cut a sharp line. Okay, because as this folds back it'll give you a nice line. So uh -huh. I'll do all my backgrounds, and like on the one with the mountains, I'll use that tip and I'll just put the shapes okay. of the mountain that I want. Sure. And then I'll start filling in. And then if I need to go a little more detailed, I go a little smaller, and I've got ones that are that are quarter inch wide sure. that I'll go through and do you know little marks and things. But yeah, okay. the angle brushes, between these three and a small half inch angle brush is probably Gets all your work done just about. 85%. Huh? Okay, okay. And so is that the kind of thing, you know, that someone maybe that's even never painted could go to a hobby store and buy? Oh, sure. Brushes like sure. that? Sure. They have, they'll have sets, you know, of three or four of the mo most okay. common styles of brushes. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to play with it depending on the style you're wanting sure. to do. Um, figure out which ones you like. And the bristles are different, you know, they'll they'll act different for you. Right. And, it, and every person paints different, okay. how much pressure they use, uh, if they're wispy with their brush or, you know, so you have to play around with it, but you can pick up a basic set real inexpensively. Yeah, sure, okay. Yeah. And what would you say to someone that's maybe thinking about getting into painting, maybe he's never done it before? Just Don't hesitate. Okay. Just get some paint, get a couple canvases, start out small if you want. Um, I started out relatively big even, but go ahead and do it. Uh, All it is is paint on a canvas. Mm -hmm. If you don't like what you did, you can white over the whole thing and do it again. That's the beauty about paint, I think, you know, and yeah. it's if you mess up, it's okay. That's part of art. That's Sometimes right. Sometimes the mess ups are the best things, I've heard. I exactly, exactly. <laughs> In fact, some of the abstract, when I started doing abstract, all of a sudden they didn't come out the way I wanted and I'd go, go and get a drink out of the kitchen and I'd walk back in and as I'm walking in, I'm going, oh, wow. Great. That's not so bad. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, a little highlight here and it's going to be just fine. Yeah, well, great. Well, Dan, we certainly thank you for coming on the show today and for sharing your work with us. Oh, it's I very, appreciate you having me here stuff. with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm here with Kit Maurice from Charleston. Kit, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Kit has a folk art collection, and you know a lot of artists, you're an artist yourself, also collect art. So can you tell me what inspired you to start collecting folk art? Um, you know, I guess it goes back to probably childhood memories and things we had in our house. Um, my mother was a big collector of antiques, mm -hmm. as was her mother. Okay. And so I grew up with a lot of these kind of southern country antiques and an appreciation of that. And then um, one of the pieces that I brought, which is kind of a touch piece for my collection, mm -hmm is this basket that my grandmother actually collected in the 19-teens. Oh, okay. And it's an Akimel O'odham, or um, formerly known as the Pima people, who live in Arizona, a Native American okay. group there. And they make these beautiful geometric baskets. Okay, yeah, that's really um, nice. And so... And it's a coil basket. But okay. my grandmother, again, had collected that in the 19-teens. And then my mother had it for years and years in her office. And then when I got a bit older and I started taking art history classes, and I actually took a, a class in Native American art history mm -hmm. and started learning about baskets and saw this very distinctive rim wrap, mm -hmm. I realized that that was a Akimel O'odham basket. And so I asked Mother if it was okay if I liberated it from her office, <laughs> and she allowed I like me that to. that term, liberation. <laughs> so that was kind of, again, a, a, a touch piece. So that was for, kind of one of the starters, maybe. It was, it, midway along the way, but it's something, I, again, I've just always appreciated um, in, in my mother's house and then 
fortunately, it's it's now in my house. Okay, so that's really a collector's piece passed down through the generations. Yes. So. Well, and it's not just Native American folk art that you collect, right? That's correct. It's all different kinds. Tell us a little bit about the different kinds that are here. We'll talk about okay. specific yeah. pieces more in a second. Um, well, I do have uh, quite a few different American folk art pieces, and I have a lot of Mexican folk art pieces, and also some Haitian folk art pieces, and a few other things from throughout Latin America okay. and the Caribbean, but uh, kind of Mexico and Haiti would be uh, more of a central focus. Okay, and uh, do you that actually kind of work that I have. travel to these places to collect these things, or do you? How do you get them? Most of them, sadly, I haven't collected them directly from the artists, but um, I do travel to Austin, Texas um, mm -hmm. somewhat frequently. I have a sister down there, and there are a lot of galleries, and of course Mexican folk art is very popular in that region. Um, and I also just, through the years of working at the museum, and I get to know other people with museums and galleries, mm -hmm. and so there's kind of a network of people out there that, I, and I know who has good stuff. <laughs> sure, so once you've identified those so, people, you can go back to them for more. So. Right, okay. yes. And what's kind of your criteria as a collector of folk art? What do you look for when you go out and want a piece? Um, you know, that's a good question. There are certain artists who I collect specifically. Um, examples of that would be the Aguilar family, and I have a few examples oh, right up um, there which we the can talk there. about. Okay. Yeah. Um, for example, this is a piece by Josefina Aguilar. Okay. Um, she's the matriarch of the family, and she's okay. been making, um, they're from Oaxaca, Mexico, the state of Oaxaca. Oh, okay. And of course, Oaxaca is really known as a craft center in Mexico. And so she makes these ceramic um, pieces. Um, this particular one is a portrayal of Frida Kahlo, the Mexican I painter. I thought so, it looked who is married a lot like that, Diego I wonder. Rivera. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's actually a whole series of, of Frida Kahlo's that okay. um, they have done. Um, and then this is another Josefina Aguilar okay. piece. And I thought this it's one was different. charming yeah. in that <laughs> Josefina is very religious, and she. Uh, this is kind of a morality tale about okay. the evils of smoking and drinking. I see that, yeah. <laughs> so good. hence we have the little devils here. Okay. Um, but and very I think colorful too. That's something that does attract me to this work is the the color, but just the whimsy, the sense sure. of whimsy mm -hmm. about it is really fun. Mm -hmm. um, this is one other Mexican ceramic piece. This is not Aguilar family. This is actually an Alfonso Castillo. Okay. Um, and another Day of the Dead piece. Um, mm -hmm. I do have quite a few pieces that are inspired by Day of the Dead. That's El Dia de, de los Muertos. Muertos in Mexico, correct? Right. Okay. Um, and so this is a portrayal um, of a little uh, calavera or skull. Okay. Um, at with the altar, the offering that um, the ofrenda right. that they would build for the spirits of, or you know, the people. Okay. And deceased. very common, it seems. Mm -hmm. in the, and what would you say qualifies the things you collect as folk art? What is what makes that a category of art? That's a great question, and it's uh, also a controversial yeah, one. I'm sure. Um, you know, some of these pieces very neatly fit into this folk art category in mm -hmm. that it's passed down through generations. It has a function within the culture, um, but these days with the art world being you know pretty much international right uh, many of these artists have gotten savvy to creating pieces for the collector's market right okay. um, so they might not have that traditional um, function within the culture but that's certainly where it comes out of okay okay um, the Aguilar family again is a great example of that she you know these are just pure expressions of their own aesthetic okay and so is it something that you know when I think of folk art, I think of more of handmade. Is that kind of? These are all handmade, so that is one distinction mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, nothing here is mass produced. Right. With that said, there are some forms where there's a whole atelier or you know um, family of artists that will work together. Okay. Um, well, Hawk and wood carving. That's this an example. Okay. That is the, the lobster piece here. Um, that's a Blas um. family piece. And um, these wood carvings grew out of a tradition of carving wooden masks, which did have a ceremonial function mm -hmm. within the culture. Um, but then the, the carvers were so good at carving masks that outsiders started noticing their, their carving. Okay. And they started creating more sculptural pieces, Got such as what attention. you were just holding okay. up. So it kind of evolves just like, you know, the market not only involves, mm -hmm. but so do the artists. Yes. Okay. What about That's this true. piece here? I find this yeah. very interesting. Now, this I is, really like how it looks. This could be a, a much more traditional um, okay. piece. This is a tigre mask from 
um, the village of Zitlala in okay. Guerrero, Mexico. And they have a very specific style of Tigre mask in this village. That's how okay. we're able to identify this. This probably dates from circa 1960. Mm -hmm. um, and this is used in a ceremonial dance. That's, um, that was and this leather form questions. with yeah. the boar's bristles okay. is, again, a, a very typical of, of that specific region. Okay. And so this is a good example of a piece that, that is, uh, you know, it's still connected to its function, its ceremonial function. Yeah, it actually is embedded in tradition. Mm -hmm. And do you see a lot of that? You know, is that a lot where folk art seems to come from, is embedded in traditions? Yes, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, and, you know, again, there are many definitions that kind of float around mm -hmm. out there. Oftentimes, folk artists don't have formal training in art. Okay. Um, as in, academic training, Art Institute of Chicago, something like right. that, but that doesn't mean they don't have training in art. Of course, they're learning from other generations or maybe it's a master apprentice kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but then there are pieces that kind of stray from that uh -huh. and they're a singular vision of a singular artist and they have absolutely no association with, with a certain function. Okay. Um, and I do have some of that. I actually brought things that are kind of in between, though. Okay, sure. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm so. sure as a collector, though, you see a lot of different things across the spectrum. But sure. let's talk about this uh, beautiful, shiny right. piece so right that, here. Right, so that's kind of where I was going with that, actually. <laughs> um, these, uh, this is called a drop of voodoo. Okay. Um, and what that's that means is me. <laughs> um, voodoo flag. Okay. Um, I'm using voodoo, that word, um, that's the Creole uh, spelling and pronunciation for Haitian voodoo. Okay. And these flags were initially ceremonial flags that were used at the start of a ceremony, and each flag would depict a specific spirit or loa. Okay. Um, in this case, Dambala is the serpent spirit, and he's also a creator spirit. He's okay. a really um, important spirit within mm -hmm. the voodoo religion. And this is all hand sequined and there's beads on here and right, it's a canvas backing mm -hmm. and then they sew on sequins and then to attach each sequin there is a little glass bead okay so that's why it refracts the light so much right it tracks your um, attention right off the bat it's first and thing the early oh. ones were like that but typically not fully beaded and sequined okay um, in the 1960s the first generation of flag artists who were using these, again, in a ceremony, in a temple, mm -hmm. um, started teaching a younger generation uh, about this. Okay. And uh, also at the same time, it began, it was being noticed outside of Haiti. And so that encouraged artists, in, again, starting about the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. to start making art flags. Okay. So this no longer has that specific ceremonial function, although the subject matter still is. Okay, yeah. Um, this is by Petit Frère Mojeru, um, and this one dates to probably the 1990s. Oh, wow. Um, and one of the really important first generation mm -hmm. artists is Yves Telemach. And, okay, and that's. Um, that is his that drop of vodou. Okay. Um, Claire Messine, or um, Saint Claire, is, mm -hmm. who's being portrayed there. And um, Telemach was also the first one to start signing his flags. Oh, okay. So yeah, again, I see first, that. first generation of the flag makers. Um, Mojiru is actually second generation. Okay. But we're now in the third generation of Haitian flag maker art flag. Oh, makers. okay. That's very interesting. You know, that's a good perspective on it. That it's not you know the oldest oldest craft, right. but it is something. And it's not static. I mean, none of these are sure, static. They sure. continue. Um, to evolve and, and change and adapt. Okay, and what about this? Um, I, that's I think this is fascinating. <laughs> it gets your attention, that's for sure, you it, know? You know, I brought that one because that was my first Haitian carnival mask. Okay. Um, of course, carnival is, uh, you know, uh, like Mardi Gras, the right, pre-Lenten right. mm -hmm. ceremony. In um, the village of Jacques Mel, which is also a big handicraft center in Haiti, mm -hmm. um, they have several of these mask makers that make them specifically okay. for Carnival Jacques Mel. Right. Um, this particular piece is made by an artist named Georges Marshall, and he specializes in animal forms. Okay. Um, and I have another one by him that's uh, this fantastic lion with this huge long mane. Um, <laughs> I brought that one because that was the first one. Okay. Um, and so, so that kind of started a, me in that right. direction. And that's kind of one of, of the collecting. more functional <laughs> pieces in ceremony. Yeah, so that things. actually would have been worn during Carnival. Okay, yeah. great. And, you know, there's just so many, you know, you said you collect a lot of these. There's so many possibilities with that, it seems like. So is that something, you know, you'll, you think you'll continue to get more of? Or are you kind of done? You know, or? 
these are large, as you know. Right, yes. <laughs> and I have, uh, I think I have about five or six now, and I'm, unless I have a bigger place, <laughs> so I'm probably not right. going to do a whole lot more of that particular okay. um, category. All right. Well, Kit, thanks for coming today. We're out of time. Oh, sure. We appreciate you sharing your folk <laughs> art collection with us. But that went fast. Yeah, it does. Well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for watching Hobbies, Crafts, and Collectibles today. If you know someone that has an interesting hobby, craft, or collectible, we'd love to hear from you. So give us a call, email us, or just let us know about them. Thanks for watching today.